Sandy, thank you so much. I want to bring in my contributor for the next 30 minutes, Jim Tish, who's the CEO and president of Lowe's Corporation. He's also the chairman of the board of directors for Diamond Offshore Drilling. Jim, it's always wonderful to have you on the program. It's great to be here, Maria. Thank you so much for joining me today. First, I want to get your take as you look around the world and these conflicts and, of course, look at the U.S. for investment opportunities. Uh, what's your take on, on the latest uh, happenings out of Russia and Ukraine? I think it could be very serious. Uh, there's no doubt that R Russia is going to get control of Crimea. But as we heard, they've got troops on the uh, borders of eastern Ukraine. If perchance the Russians should go into eastern Ukraine this weekend or sometime soon, that could be really bad news uh, for the U.S. politically as well as for the stock market. So. It's anybody's guess right now. Yeah, I mean, so far it seems like the U.S. is talking tough once again, but we haven't done anything. But it, it all comes back to natural gas and oil, right? Well, first of all, there, is, there isn't that much that the United States can do in the short term anyway. The, the Russia, I think Russian investors are going to be a very important part of this because the Russian stock market is down 20% since the beginning of the year, and the Russian ruble is down another 10%. Uh, I don't know how much Vladimir Putin looks at Russian investors versus geopolitics, but I'm sure it is some sort of influence on him. Yeah, so in other words, you say maybe the markets will push the hand of Putin uh, before anybody else pushes his hand. Or maybe it, it can get him to be a bit more restrained exactly. than he otherwise might be, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, watching the Russian stock market plummet and capital come out of Russia, that capital has to find a home somewhere. But, I mean, what, what's the worry that the, these people will lose their money on, and they figure, look, Russia is acquiring, you know, breaking international law. Um, I'm out of here. I'm going to think about this later. I think it's, it's all about the Russian economy and what kind of growth Putin can deliver for uh, the or 250 million Russians uh, that are there. It's been a pretty stagnant economy to date, and if he were to go into eastern Ukraine, my guess is there would be big sanctions that uh, would be put on Russia, trade embargoes, and that would be doubly bad for the Russian economy. And, and it's also going to be very bad for the European economy if, in fact, we see that, you know, fire hose of natural gas that, that runs to Europe through, you know, through Ukraine actually stop. So that's, that's a problem for uh, the Europeans. Actually, Ronald Reagan warned about that in the 80s when they were first thinking of building the Russian pipeline uh, to Europe. It was built nonetheless. The Europeans are now very reliant on Russian gas. And the thing that the United States can do for the medium to long term, not for the short term, is to allow the exportation of more natural gas from the United States so that that gas could displace the Russian gas that's currently uh, going into Europe. Well, this is a really important point, and I want to get your take on, on the U.S. and this energy, ex, you know, this energy huge opportunity that we have in this country that we are probably not tapping into as much as we could. Um, President Obama says he's going to decide on the Keystone Pipeline in the next couple of months. Um, obviously, you know, Diamond Offshore, part of your company, uh, uh, as well as CNA, you see so much in terms of insurance, in terms of energy. How would you characterize things right now in the U.S.? In terms of the energy markets, they're very strong. Uh, natural gas production has been increasing in the United States by about 5% uh, for the past several years. The forecasts are that it will continue to increase. Um, there have been several LNG uh, projects that have been approved already by the Energy Department. There are still close to another 20 that are awaiting approval. Uh, it's possible that uh, in the next five years, the United States could be exporting 10 billion cubic feet of natural gas. That's on a base of 65 billion cubic feet. The good news, though, is that even with that gas that's being exported, it won't change the price of natural gas that much because we have extraordinary amounts of natural gas that can be produced at about today's market price. So what that means is more jobs and more investment in America, and it also means uh, more natural gas liquids and feedstocks for chemical producers that are in the United States, which has a tremendous cost advantage over the rest of the world. So it's, it's generally all positive for the United States if 
a big if, if the government just allows it to occur. Well, It'll occur on its own. So, so this is more about politics than, than leadership. I'm sorry, but it is I, I, in terms of not tapping into, you know, what we have, the potential that we have in this country. That's right. It, it, a, a, lot, a lot of it is politics, yes. Yeah. I will, we'll talk more about this and in, in investing around these, uh, these, these big stories in the U.S. First of all, let's get to Sandra Smith looking at gold prices today. I want to bring back Jim Tish here, uh, one of Lowe's subsidiaries, of course, as we've been talking about Diamond Offshore drilling. Uh, and and uh, we were been talking about this opportunity in, in the energy business and the industry for the, uh, for the country, Jim. This has been highlighted because much more so as a result of the impact of Ukraine and Russia. Everyone's saying, look, Europe has their hands tied. They need this uh, natural gas from uh, Russia and Ukraine, and uh, the U.S. needs to be much more energy independent. Well, and in fact, we are well, well, well on our way to an energy independence. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if on a BTU basis today the United States is already energy independent. So really? we, we, are, we are producing an awful lot of BTUs. We're still importing oil, but our oil production last year, for example, increased by a million barrels a day. That's an enormous increase. That represented all of the increase in non-OPEC oil production, just to give you a sense of how, how fast our energy production is growing. And that's despite the fact that it's harder to get permits. I mean, government is in the way in, in, in many regards. I, I, the Keystone's a big issue. The Keystone's a big issue, and Keystone uh, uh, relates to Canadian oil. But I've got to say that with respect to the uh, land drilling business in the United States, generally the government isn't involved. They're not involved for the good or for the bad. They're, okay. they're pretty much out of it. Okay, so they're out of it. So they're, they're not necessarily making it tougher in terms of permitting. No. The big not, oil guys are saying maybe, maybe that's outside the U.S. Or, or that, that could be offshore, but with, with respect to land drill, generally the U.S. government is not involved. So the Bakken shale, the Marcella shale, those all have uh, uh, had the explosive growth uh, with no, generally no input from the federal government. I, I just love this story. I really do. I think this is such a big opportunity for the U.S., the energy space, and I think it's a big opportunity for investment. But I've got to get your take on the broader markets here. One last thing about uh, e the energy growth. Yeah. It's also an enormous job story. There, there are an enormous number of jobs, not just the guys on the drilling rigs, but there are the guys building the pipelines, uh, building the terminals for the railroads, building all the pipelines, the drill pipe, all the equipment. This stuff is all American-made, and it's literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs. So it's energy independence, exporting uh, natural gas will be great for our trade deficit and our trade balance, and it's jobs. It's, it's like the phenomenal for our economy. Well, you know how CEOs today say, look, we can't even find the people that we need to put in the jobs that we may have because they don't have the skill sets. When it comes to energy jobs, does that require certain, you know, training in terms of, you know, working on the rigs, in terms of putting, uh, producing the pipelines? It, it, it absolutely does. Which and means it's a higher paying job. Yes, they, they, are, they are generally very good paying jobs, and the industry is very good at going out and finding people, training people, and putting them in the right, in the right places. So I, I love having your insight on the subject, Jim. You're, you're right there and, and, and so knowledgeable, so thank you for sharing your insights. Let's talk about markets here. Sure. <laughs> Dow Industrial is up again today, 31 points. Some people say, look, the buybacks are supporting this market. Some people say, well, profits are going to be up 8% year over year in the fourth quarter. It should be where it is. And you say what? I say calling, calling the stock market is a very dangerous business. But I'm seeing signs that may lead me to conclude that things look a bit toppy. What are some of the signs? First of all, the stock market last year was up 25% when earnings were up only 5%. Mm. Um, secondly, when you look at some of the tech stocks, which really reflect a lot of the enthusiasm of the stock market, they've been up two times that. Uh, Amazon is up 50%. Google's up close to 50% year over year. Look at Tesla Motors. It's up five times uh, in, the, in the past year. So there is an enormous amount of bullishness and enthusiasm 
for the tech areas. And by the way, these are not small companies. These are companies whose market cap is measured in the tens of billions, if not the hundreds of billions of dollars. So these, these increases are enormous. Combined with that, my private equity friends are telling me that they're selling as much as they can. Right but now, they, they're big sellers. They're, they're, they, are big, they are liquidating their investments that they've made over the past several years, and they're slow walking their acquisitions. They're no dopes. And finally, one other, one other indicator to me, uh, look at Fortress, uh, Fortress the Investment hedge fund. Fortress, yeah. Fortress mm -hmm. Investments. Uh, just the other day, so in public? In, inside, they know they're public, yeah. but insiders they want sold, to sell more. Yeah. sold a bunch of stock. And so I think you also have to take note of that. So insiders selling in Fortress, private equity guys selling into the rally. This is their realization period. And these are, these are good investors. Yes. I, when you mention a company like Tesla, you have to look at the profitability of the company. And the numbers are nowhere near you know, the, the, uh, the stock price performance, and yet people are calling Tesla a battery company, listen, not a car company. Listen. <laughs> I'm calling uh, it I, a tech, even you called it a technology company. Yes, and, and when you, first of all, they've produced a fabulous, fabulous product. Everybody that I know that has it or that's dri driven it says it is unbelievable. Me too, I agree, I'm, I'm one of so them. So I, I, I don't want to demean their product in any way, all I'm saying is that the stock price seems to be discounting an awful lot of success. And you're also mentioning a lot of important stories like private equities, uh, guys, they're no dopes, the uh, number of tech stocks trading at, at lofty levels. So you're a seller into this market? You want to be a, you, you, I, you know, I don't, I, I, you're not trading, I of don't, course. I, I don't want to be a stock market timer, but yeah. I, I would say to you that, yes, uh, we have been reducing our exposure uh, to the stock market. All right. But, but again, stock market timing is a very, very dangerous business. Right. So okay. I, want, I want that caveat to be known. Yeah, the caveat is important. All right, Jim, more with Jim Tish as we continue here. We are just about an hour into the trading day. And we're back with Jim Tish, CEO and President of Lowe's Corporation. Jim, let's talk about Washington Wall Street. You and I have discussed this before when, uh, when Washington was uh, fighting over the debt ceiling. Have we moved away from the ledge in terms of debt and these deadlines uh, that we've been facing? Number one, in ter specifically in terms of debt, absolutely. And I think they extended that uh, for uh, another year or so. Mm -hmm, 2015, yeah. But even beyond that, I'm sensing that there's, that the enormous uh, partisanship that existed is starting to be chipped away at. Really? Yes. When you look at it, uh, uh, there was a budget that was produced between Patty Murray, uh, a Democrat in the Senate, Senate and Paul Ryan, the, the budget chair in the Congress. Uh, you see... Uh, uh, agreement in the Senate on extended unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, you're seeing um, everywhere you look little signs that there's more bipartisanship that's taking place, that, that both sides understand how damaging the partisanship has been and there are there are little sprouts that, that are saying to me that uh, things are getting better. Most recently, Lamar Alexander and Chuck Schumer are, have gotten the okay from Harry Reid to introduce uh, and debate legislation on the floor of, floor of the Senate, which is a first in a long, long yeah. time. So those signs, I think, are really important. I think it, it's helped the markets, and I think it's helped confidence a little. If we see this sustain, I think it's I think it's helped I think it's helped a lot because I th I think the markets really didn't like uh, the, the brinksmanship point. the brinksmanship legislation the public didn't like that things were gummed up in the Senate in the House and and I think that logjam is really starting to break. And is that because we have uh, a congressional election this year? We've got the 2014 elections coming up. Uh, does that have something to do with it, or is this actually they realize they can't keep fighting and having the back and forth and keep the economy a, a hostage? You know, I, th I think it's the latter. I think, I think uh, what they're realizing is that better for them and better for the country that they do the country's business than that 
they just bicker all day long. Yeah. It's, they, listen, they will always continue to make their political case and their political, political points, but I think they also understand now that there's legislation that needs to be passed, and uh, they've got to do that. That's a positive, certainly for the economy as well. What are you seeing right now in terms of the economy? Right, well, one, more thing yeah, on, one, one more thing on the government, and that is that uh, Dave Camp came out with his proposal right. for, for taxes. Uh, I, think, I don't think a tax bill is going to get passed now, but I wouldn't be surprised to see one passed in the next session of Congress because you've got Ron Wyden coming in as the uh, chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, Ron's... Ron's uh, proposals for taxes are actually very similar uh, to, to uh, Congressman Camp. They're both in favor of dramatically reducing the rates, dramatically broadening the base, and there's no doubt in my mind that there's a real possibility that come 2015 we could possibly see some significant tax reform. That would be huge. This that is would be what huge. so many people yes. are waiting for. So. What does that mean? Corporate taxes come down. The base is broadened out, meaning you take away some of the loopholes. Let's not call them loopholes uh, because uh, today's, today's loophole was yesterday's incentive. Incentives. So they're deductions that, Look, that are they're, they're deductions. You're absolutely right because loophole connotates that you're doing something wrong. Exactly. This is all under the law and it is incentive to do something uh, differently in your business and you're getting this different tax treatment. And, and by the way, I I'm don't know... I'm glad you said that. I don't know, I'm so I, happy you said You're right. Don't call them loopholes. I don't know one congressman or one senator who would say that he voted in favor of a loophole. He voted in favor of incentives. That's absolutely right. Um, so, so, but that's, no, that's what we're talking about, right? Taking away some of those incentives to broaden out the base. Yes, that's right. I exactly right. And you broaden the base, you lower the rate. Uh, some people will pay more, some people will pay less, but I think the important thing here is that by broadening the base, by reducing all these different incentives, more, more of the economic winners and losers are determined on Main Street rather than in Washington. Yep, that's, that's really, really important. It, it, put, it, it starts to put an end to what they call the crony capitalism, where if you have a good lobbyist, you get the benefits, and if you don't, you're, you lose out. Such an important point, Jim. Thank you for making it. All right, we're going to talk about the economy after this short break. Well, investors concerned about what's going on with China's economy. We've seen this raft of recent weak data and risks of a credit bubble have come back into focus after the country's first bond default in recent history. Chinese banking regulators now putting pressure on banks there to cut business lending by as much as 20%. And not surprisingly, there's been a rush of analysts cutting their China first quarter growth forecast. JP Morgan slashing his forecast to 6.2% 6 from 7.2%. And the industries that are particularly under focus in China, you're talking about the steel mills, the manufacturing, because they took out loans with commodities as collateral against those loans. We've seen commodity prices tumble, and therefore they're a big risk. The government in Beijing saying, we've got to rein this in. Yeah, and, and I guess, Jim Tish, you know, when you look at China, 5% growth is very different than 11% growth, very different than 7% growth. For a long time, all we talked about is China being the, the jewel of, the, of growth for the world. Yeah, that's right, and, and people thought that 7.5% was the low that was going to be, be seen in terms of growth in China, and now, uh, Ashley, you're talking about growth of 6.2%. Yes. That's, that's, that's going to be a big, big disappointment to the world. Now, and, and Sandra, you've been covering, you know, what's, what's happening uh, as far as the market reaction to what's happening in Ukraine. Yes as well as in China. And you've been talking, Maria, so much this week about copper prices, and everybody's watching what's happening over in Asia to determine where some of these commodity prices are going. This is a year-to-date look at the price of copper, just to give you an idea of the expectation of the slowing that is expected over there, considering China is the number one consumer of copper in the world. So that definitely playing out. It's below three bucks now. And Maria, but look at this, though. We had overnight uh, Hong Kong, Tokyo, the index is over there down, but not necessarily following suit here this morning. Morning. So not every day are we just following what's happening overseas. That's true. But you mentioned Ukraine, Maria, and uh, the MISEX today in Russia dropping more than 3%. The ruble, of course, tumbling, yeah. bonds falling. Uh, this Sunday, the Crimean uh, referendum is going to happen. It looks like no matter what they try and do, it's going to happen. And we already know the outcome, that they're going to uh, get more autonomy from Ukraine and more than likely vote to join Russia. Well, the point that Jim made earlier in the show is that the markets may very well be sort of pushing Putin uh, more so than anybody else. 
else is pressuring yeah. him because, you know, it's, it's money and it, it's it capital leaving the country. And it's, it's the Russian economy. And, you know, for us, it's jobs. For him also, it's jobs. He's got, he's got to produce jobs. And if there are trade sanctions, yeah. if there's no confidence, jobs are going to disappear. I think the most extraordinary story, though, is this Malaysia missing jet. I mean, I, I don't understand in a world where, you know, we've got drones and cameras yeah. all over the place that you could see a pin in someone's hand yep. that we cannot find this plane. Well, I think it's interesting. The more this goes on, the weirder it becomes, but there are continuing to be more and more reports now, Reuters being the latest, that it appears there was a coordinated effort to turn off the transponder on this plane and then later other systems. Therefore, it was a deliberate move. The, 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 I think it's growing now that uh, it's a fact that this plane flew for a total of five hours. It disappeared after an hour. What did it do in the next four hours? And we have military radar suggesting that there was a plane passing through there way to the west of where the original route was. Um, clearly, as, as we were saying earlier, it's a complete shambles as far as the Malaysian authorities are concerned. They're completely overwhelmed. They don't know what they're doing. Hopefully the U.S. can get in there and authorities who know what they're doing can really try and track down what happened to this plane. But at this point, nobody knows and any theory out there cannot be disproved. Mm. All of these stories, Jim, are you seeing an impact on the U.S. economy? What's your take on where we are right now? For the past five years, my fearless forecast was that the U.S. economy was going to grow at 2%. And, and, <laughs> that is a fearless forecast. No, and, 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 and so far, it's been right. My fearless forecast for 2014 is that growth will be about 3%. When I don't think we don't have the uh, headwinds of the tax increase that we had last year. Uh, yes, the, the uh, recovery is getting a little long in the tooth, but it hasn't been very significant in terms of distance moved from the bottom compared to other recoveries. And I think it's entirely possible that uh, with people feeling a little better about what's going on in Washington without the tax headwinds, uh, we could, we could really see uh, on the order of 3% growth this year. So you don't worry about emerging markets where we continue to see, you know, money coming out, capital flight out of emerging markets. So you don't worry that China is, you know, going to impact this by slowing down? Oh, oh, listen, all of that is, is worrisome. But, but what there is is a balance. And there, there are the positive things and there are the negative things. And as I... Uh, Put them through my head. I I, uh, I come to the conclusion that yeah, yeah, you know, there put you the go. finger up in the air. I th I think um, we'll see about three percent growth. All right, we we will uh, we will be watching that, and of course, uh, the economy has signs already that things have begun to improve in in quite a substantial way. Jim, it's been wonderful having you on the program today. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Jim Tish, President, CEO of Lowe's Corporation. Join me today. We'll take a short break. We are awaiting Secretary of State John Kerry's news conference following the meeting with uh, his uh, counterpart, Russian Foreign Minister. We will bring you that live the moment he speaks. I'm Maria Bartiromo. You're watching the opening bell with a market of 23 points on the Dow on the Fox Business Network. Back in a moment.